to be that we are at the be beginning, the dawning of a second golden age of black hole research uh, as a result of two things. Numerical simulations on computers of the dynamical behavior of warp space time on one hand and the uh, gravitational wave observations uh, that uh, uh, will begin uh, to occur within the next several years. Those are both stimulating new theoretical work and the combination of the three, new theoretical work stimulated by gravitational wave observations and uh, numerical simulations is uh, likely to produce insights comparable to those that came from the first golden age. The first golden age was the period uh, when I was a very young researcher. I got my PhD in 1962, so I date this from 1963, my postdoctoral years. Uh, the first golden age was in fact driven by the observational discovery of quasars in 1963. I, I don't claim any credit for that following my PhD. Uh, driven by the observational discovery of quasars, uh, the realization that they are powered by big black holes at the centers of galaxies, uh, the recognition that there is a big black hole at the center of most large galaxies such as our own, the discovery by the Uhuru X-ray satellite of compact X-ray sources, uh, and the realization that uh, many of those are, uh, are X-ray emission from gas being pulled off of a companion star and dragged onto, a, through an accretion disk, onto a companion black hole. And the realization that there, in fact, are 100 million small black holes in every galaxy like our own. On the theoretical side, in, the, in this first golden age, Stephen Hawking formulated the concept of the black hole horizon as the point of no return, the boundary between events which can and cannot send signals to infinity. Uh, the, there was a recognition that black holes can by, be dynamical, they can spin, they can vibrate. The realization that uh, the spin entails the storage of a large amount of energy which can be released astrophysically up to 29% of the black hole's mass. Uh, is tied up in uh, spin energy. Uh, the formulation of the laws of, laws of black hole mechanics and the realization that those laws of black hole mechanics uh, are actually black laws of black hole thermodynamics, realization that came from Hawking radiation, Stephen Hawking's marvelous discovery in the early 1970s. So these are just a few of the great things that came from the first golden age. Uh, the first golden age taught us to think about a, a spinning quiescent black hole as a, a curved black hole in terms of embedding diagrams so that if you embed the equatorial slice through a curved black hole in a surrounding embedding space, it has a shape like this. Uh, we came to recognize that there is a lapse function and a shift function in the metric. The lapse function describes the slowing of time as you near the horizon. So if the horizon is down here in the embedding diagram, uh, the dividing line between the, uh, between the yellow and the red, time is flowing at a rate that is 10% of the rate of flow far away. The lapse function is 0.1. Uh, and that uh, there is a dragging of inertial frames, or you can think of it as dragging of space into motion with an angular velocity that uh, increases as you near the horizon, angular velocity characterized by these white arrows. One of the goals of the new golden age is going to be to map the space-time geometry of a black hole and see whether it is indeed uh, this space-time geometry. And space-based missions such as LISA will do that with exquisitely high accuracy. So the goal, turn this into a true experimental science uh, instead of just a largely theoretical science. As of about two years ago, uh, the uh, situation with quiescent black holes, that is black holes that are not uh, vibrating, not colliding, was that we understood the theory very well, but there were very few observation, uh, very little observational evidence for anything except their gravitational pull. In the last couple of years, there has got, come to be, through electromagnetic observations, stronger and stronger evidence that many black holes have large spins and the beginning of really plausible measurements of black hole spins. Uh, and so this is beginning to end through electromagnetic observations. It will come to a crashing end with gravitational wave observations. For wildly dynamical black holes, the black holes, for example, that are orbiting each other, come together, collide, and merge. 
black holes where each black hole drags inertial frames in its vicinity, much like the air in a tornado. So you have two tornadoes with the orbital angular momentum also dragging inertial frames. So two tornadoes embedded in a third larger tornado and they come crashing together uh, and they excite some sort of highly dynamical behavior of warp space time. We have ha uh, very little understanding from the, uh, before 2009. The exceptions are a few important theorems. Penrose's singularity theorem, that there's a, a singularity at the center of each black hole. Hawking's area increase theorem. But besides a few theorems, we had very little understanding of the nonlinear dynamics of curved space time generated when black holes collide and absolutely no observational data. And that is what is going to change. You know, it's as though we had seen the surface of the ocean on a calm day, but we had never seen the ocean in a storm. We had never seen crashing waves. And our objective in the new golden age is to see space-time, the space-time geometry in a storm, space-time geometry uh, when, there are, uh, when there are water spouts and analogs of crashing waves. Uh, and uh, these, this kind of highly dynamical behavior entails some of the deepest issues in the nature of classical space-time and some of the most interesting astrophysical phenomena. Uh, this new old golden age, as I have said, is being driven by numerical simulations of colliding black holes and by observations of colliding black holes using gravitational waves. Uh, sorry. And also, part of the new golden age will be research into quantum black holes, uh, connections of this to string theory, to LHC physics. Uh, and I will not discuss uh, those kinds of issues, but I will leave th uh, that for other people to discuss. Concerning numerical simulations, the techniques for numerical simulations have been under development since the 1960s. But big success has only occurred in the last few years. Uh, but the success has now come to the point where these simulations are beginning to teach us about the nonlinear dynamics of curved space time. John Wheeler, who was my PhD thesis advisor at Princeton in the late uh, 1950s, early 60s, conceived the concept of geometrodynamics, by which he meant just precisely this nonlinear dynamics of curved space time. He in a very inspirational way, exhorted all of his colleagues and students to go out and learn about geometric dynamics. But we have not really had the tools to do so until now. And it's numerical simulations that are finally teaching us about this. And that's what I'm going to focus on for the first part of my talk. A few words about numerical relativity. How is it done? Let me just say, I'm not a numerical relativist. I, uh, uh, do not participate in uh, developing the codes uh, or even the algorithms for simulations. But I'm a theorist who has the very good sense to talk to the numeric relativists and to collaborate with them to pull science out of the simulations. And this is what I think is a very important part of this new golden age is these collaborations between theorists like me and the superb young scientists who are doing the simulations. Uh, so f the first step is you evolve, well, the name of the game is you evolve the geometry of space-time rather than evolving fields that live in space-time. You begin by picking a space-like hypersurface. You lay out coordinates on that space-like hypersurface. You specify the three-dimensional metric and the extrinsic curvature of the hypersurface. I remind you the extrinsic curvature is, uh, roughly speaking, it's the first time derivative of the metric. Uh, but you have to subject, uh, specify them subject to the constrained equations, the time, uh, time, space, and time, time components of the Einstein equations, uh, which constrain those initial data. Those are the analogs of divergence of the magnetic field equal to zero in uh, electromagnetism. Uh, having uh, satisfied, somehow solved the constrained equations uh, and laid down then a metric and an extrinsic curvature, you then lay out coordinates to, to the future of this uh, space-like hypersurface by specifying the lapse function and the shift function. And this is the big step. You integrate the three-dimensional metric forward in time using dynamical equations. And that's what has taken some 40 years to really be able to do and do uh, robustly and with high accuracy in generic situations. And then you build the full space-time metric out of the three metric, the lapse function, and the shift function. So that's, that's roughly speaking how this goes. 
There are two mature approaches to numerical relativity now. The finite difference approach where you use finite difference techniques to specify or to, to uh, describe the metric and the extrinsic curvature on this space-like hypersurface. You build a coordinate grid and you give values of the metric and the ex uh, extrinsic curvature at each point in the grid. This technique with finite difference uh, methods is very robust, uh, but it has power law convergence. Depending on how you do it, you may converge typically at the fourth power uh, of uh, the size of your grid, or the number of grid points. Uh, this technique succeeded for the first time in 2005 at the hands of Franz Pretorius initially, and then very soon thereafter, the group at the Goddard Space Flight Center led by Joan Centrella and the group at uh, the University of Texas at Brownsville led by Manuela Campanelli. I have to say I am impressed that it was two women uh, leading the pioneering efforts and, and it's wonderful to have, have that happen in, in, uh, in physics uh, in that early period. Since 2006, uh, when these codes with finite difference techniques uh, started to become robust, uh, they've been used to give us a great deal of insight about the final masses and spins of, of the merged black hole when two black holes collide, about the kicks that are given to the merged black hole by the anisotropic emission of gravitational waves, and about the shapes of the waveforms. I regard this as the S matrix approach to numerical relativity. You're finding out about the final state based on the initial state of the binary system. The second approach is the spectral description. Uh, it's a technique that has uh, been developed primarily uh, by the group led by Saul Tucholsky at Caltech, Cornell, Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics, and Washington State University. The code that has been built is called SPEC, or Spectral Einstein Code. This is a rather more complicated technique. I'll explain uh, what's involved in it in a moment. Uh, and it is, was much more slow to mature. It is now very mature, as I shall describe. And its advantage now that it is working is that uh, you have exponential convergence, a rather more, much more rapid convergence as you uh, uh, go to finer, finer grids, uh, which enables you to get very high accuracy and very great speed compared to finite difference methods. Uh, and this technique is being used to explore uh, geometrodynamics. And so most of the research, not all of it, that I will describe uh, comes from this group because that has been our focus. I'm, I, I collaborate with this particular group. Uh, the way in which this is done, spectral methods, is that uh, you divide space around the two black holes up into cells. Uh, in each cell, you expand the uh, three metric and the extrinsic curvature in terms of basis functions and you keep track of the coefficients in those expansions. Uh, and then each, the data for each cell is put on a separate uh, CPU uh, in a uh, multiprocessor computer, and then the CPUs talk to each other and exchange uh, data. Uh, this technique has been being used to generate large numbers of gravitational waveforms for use in uh, LIGO data analysis. Uh, and as I said, it's, uh, and it's being used for geometrodynamics. This is a list, probably not complete, of uh, the research groups that are simulating colliding black holes. It's a very long list. All of those, those in black uh, are using uh, the finite difference techniques, and then our collaboration uh, is now at Caltech, Cornell, and CETA for colliding black holes is using these spectral techniques. The challenge then is to simulate the two black holes going around each other, colliding, mer merging, and emitting gravitational waves. And I'd just like to remind you that in these mergers, roughly 10% of the mass of the system is emitted in gravitational waves, uh, which contrasts with the thermonuclear fusion, where at the maximum you can get one part in 200 out. So an enormous amount of uh, energy output. And the gravitational wave luminosity during a merger, you can compute as then 10% of the rest mass energy of the uh, black hole system, divided by the time on which most of the radiation comes out, which is roughly a 50 times the light travel time across the Schwarzschild radius. And that then becomes uh, 
10 to the minus 3, speed of light to the fifth divided by Newton's gravitation constant, which happens to be 10,000 times the luminosity of all the stars in the universe put together. And that's rather impressive. 10,000 universe luminosities. If these are two 10 solar mass black holes, these 10,000 universe, universe luminosities come off in something like a hundredth of a second. And you get off uh, tw two solar masses of total energy. If these are two 10 million solar mass black holes, it takes 10 million times longer and you get 10 million times more uh, energy out. But, 10, 000, but a factor of 10,000 universe luminosities is rather exciting. And so the challenge then is to detect those. And uh, unfortunately, that's a very big challenge. I'll say just a little bit about it late in the lecture. No electromagnetic waves are emitted whatsoever except, and this is a very important except, from an accretion disk around this black hole system, which will be strongly disturbed by the uh, emission of the gravitational waves, by the loss of mass from the system, and by the shaking due to the gravitational waves. And if the uh, electromagnetic observers can see the, that disturbance of the accretion disk going along with the gravitational waves, this will be very exciting. And this is what is called multi-messenger astronomy. The details of the collision are encoded in the gravitational waves waveforms. Uh, and uh, so the name of the game for the, uh, the observational side of this is to uh, measure the waveforms of the emitted gravitational waves, compare them with theoretical waveforms that come out of simulations, uh, and thereby both test general relativity in a domain of geometrodynamics, nonlinear dynamics of curved space-time, and learn a great deal about uh, what goes on uh, with black hole binary systems. Here is one of the early simulations of uh, two black holes merging. Uh, you're going to see at the top uh, the two black holes as black spots as they would be seen against the dark blue sky by somebody in our own universe. Down here in the middle is a uh, embedding diagram uh, of the two black holes going around each other uh, with the color coding being the lapse function. The uh, arrows uh, there are the negative of the shift function. So you can think of that as the uh, velocity with which of frame dragging. Uh, I should emphasize that it has turned out that it is not possible to embed the space-time geometry even of the equatorial plane of a, uh, or even of the orbital plane of a, mer of a black hole binary. Uh, it's not possible to embed it smoothly in one higher dimension. And so this is a kludge. I rarely confess this, but this is a kludge. Uh, what is actually being plotted here is uh, the scalar curvature uh, of uh, that uh, uh, of the of the three metric uh, of that slice uh, uh, through uh, of the, the scalar coverage of the two metric of that slice through the orbital plane, uh, and so you get something that re resembles an embedding diagram. Uh, at the bottom, you see the waveform, a very simple waveform that's coming out. These are two black holes that are non-spinning uh, and that are identical and that uh, will merge uh, uh, as they come together. Uh, it's a rather boring process early on. Uh, and so we will jump from uh, the early part to the late part of the in-spiral, and then pause the movie so you can admire the collision, and then let the black hole begin to settle down into its final state. So this is one way to visualize the space-time geometry in geometric dynamics. But it misses an enormous amount of what's going on. It's just, just not capturing very much of what's happening. And so uh, a collaboration of theorists that includes me and a number of uh, numerical relativists, so these are roughly half theorists and half numeric numerical relativists at Caltech, Cornell, and in South Africa, We've devised a new way to visualize the curvature of space-time so we could see visually what's happening in geometric dynamics. The idea is that we focus on something called the tidal field and something else called the frame drag field. What we do is we uh, use the uh, slicing of space-time into space plus time, the same slicing as the numerical relativists use. 
If we were looking at the electromagnetic field tensor, uh, that slicing would split the electromagnetic field tensor into an electric field and a magnetic field. We would visualize those using the integral curves of those vector fields. Uh, and so, for example, the magnetic field lines of the Earth or the integral curves of the magnetic field of the Earth, uh, and they have this standard dipolar shape. And we all know how powerful the concept of electric field lines and magnetic field lines can be. So our goal is to have a similar set of tools to visualize space-time curvature. In the case of space-time curvature, we look at the vacuum Riemann tensor, uh, that is a piece of the Riemann tensor that is not locally algebraically tied to the stress energy uh, by Einstein's equation. So it's the free part of, this, of, of the Riemann curvature tensor. That's what we call, of course, the vial curvature tensor. And when you do a 3 plus 1 split, the vial curvature tensor turns out to split up into a so-called electric part, this time, space, time, space part of the vial tensor, and a so-called magnetic part. These are symmetric trace-free tensors. The uh, electric part describes tidal accelerations through the equation of geodesic deviation. So if you have two freely par falling particles at locations Q and P, uh, then they have a relative acceleration that is given by the contraction of the uh, electric part of the vial tensor with uh, the separation vector between those two points. And for that reason, we use the name tidal field to describe this electric part, and we abandon using the word electric. This is the tidal field is one piece of the vial tensor. The other piece is the uh, magnetic part of the vial tensor, and it turns out to describe differential frame dragging something that I was surprised I couldn't find in the literature. And ultimately, we discovered that to Hugo Walquist and uh, Frank Estabrook knew this uh, many, many decades ago. And it may have been known to others, but it's not part of the, uh, today's lore. The basic idea is that if you have two inertial reference frames uh, uh, represented by gyroscopes, one at location Q and the other at location P, and you measure the precession of the gyroscope at P using the inertial frames at Q. So we're looking at relative drag of inertial frames between low, nearby points. Uh, that precession of the gyroscope at P relative to inertial frames at Q is just the contraction of BJK with the, the separation vector. And so uh, BJK, we abandoned calling it mag a magnetic uh, piece of the vial tensor. We call it the frame drag field. Uh, you may prefer frame dragging field, but I prefer to have two syllables. So the frame drag field uh, that is the second piece then of the vacuum Riemann curvature tensor. They, we then note that any symmetric trace free tensor is completely characterized by three orthogonal eigenvectors and their eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues, of course, have to sum to zero because this is trace free. And so for the tidal field, EJK, we look at the integral curves of an eigenvector, and we call that a tendex line, and we call its eigenvalue that tendex line's tendicity. Now, a familiar example is the Earth. If I have the Earth, we know that uh, if we have a person above the Earth uh, uh, laid out radially, that person will be stretched from head to foot, uh, if the person is oriented tangentially, she will be squeezed from head to foot. Uh, and uh, the radial and the tangential directions are the eigenvector fields of the tidal field. And so the uh, tendex lines are the integral curves of those eigenvector fields. So they're just circles going around uh, and the radial uh, tendex line. So they're radial stretching tendex lines and circular tangential squeezing tendex lines. Uh, in the case of a non-spinning black hole, the story is the same as for the Earth. But the case of a fast-spinning black hole is particularly interesting. People have not noticed this before, as far as I'm aware. But if you're near the pole, the polar region of a uh, fast-spinning black hole, uh, you get squeezed if you're pointed radially. And if you're near the equator, you get stretched. And so there is a, a, a squeezing tendex line that comes out of the polar region, turns out to swing around and go back into the other polar region. And there are radial stretching tendex lines. And then there is a set of spiraling tendex lines that run up 
the radial tendex lines. And this is a, the tendex that, uh, uh, set the set of tendex lines associated with our fast spinning Kerr black hole. We also introduced the idea of a horizon tendex. Uh, uh, just a second, I, I, these were in the wrong order. So we introduced the concept of horizon tendicity. We uh, look at the normal, normal component of the, uh, of the tendex field. Uh, and uh, since these tendex fields are coming in almost perpendicular, well, in this case, precisely perpendicular to the horizon, that's the same as the tendicity uh, so, so that eigenvalue, ENN, is the same as the, uh, nearly the same as the tendicity of the field lines or the tendex lines that stick out of the black hole. We uh, draw things blue for positive tendicity, the squeezing, and red for negative tendicity. And so you have these blue regions of, uh, uh, of squeezing in the polar regions and red regions of stretching in the equatorial regions. We uh, use the phrase horizon tendex for a region on the horizon that has large tendicity. So there's a belt-shaped uh, horizon tendex uh, on a curved black hole, and there are polar caps that are horizon tendexes that are squeezing tendexes on a curved black hole. A region, uh, a collection of tendex lines that have large tendicity, we uh, use the phrase tendex for them. And so a curved black hole has two sets of tendexes, uh, these equatorial ten tendexes that stretch strongly coming out of the equatorial region. And this uh, blue uh, tendex, this is a squeezing tendex that reaches from the north polar region uh, to the south polar region. And those are the really important things because it's the tendexes themselves that are producing the strong forces it's the tendex themselves in a dyna dynamical situation that are going to be emitting gravitational waves. Let me turn to uh, frame drag vortex lines and their vorticities. So for the frame drag field, uh, we introduce the integral curve of an eigenvector of the frame drag field. We call that the frame drag vortex line, and its eigenvalue is that uh, uh, vortex line's vorticity. In this case, then, we have frame drag vortex lines that come out of the north polar region and swing around below the black hole and go back into the north polar region. And those are vortex lines. If we look at this woman over here on the extreme left side of the screen, you see what's happening in terms of inertial frames is uh, if she looks down at her feet and looks at the precession of gyroscopes at her feet as seen from her head she sees a counterclockwise precession. However, if her feet look up at her head, they will also see a counterclockwise precession. So the red, tendex, the red vortex lines are counterclockwise vortex lines. Along those vortex lines, it's like, like, uh, it's like uh, twisting a towel up, wringing a towel, trying to wring water out of a towel, but doing a counterclockwise uh, wringing around a towel. Uh, and for the blue uh, vortex lines, it's a clockwise ring. So there are clockwise vortex lines where the towel is being wrung out in a clockwise way. It's really frame dragging. And counterclockwise where it's being done in a, in a counterclockwise way. And uh, there's these two sets, the red ones, the counterclockwise ones come out of the north polar regions, go back to the north polar regions. Clockwise come out of the south polar regions, go back into the south polar regions. Um, we also then introduce uh, the concept of a vortex, and this is the important concept. It's a collection of vortex lines with large vorticity. So there are two vortexes sticking out of a curved black hole. There is a counterclockwise vortex uh, sticking out of the north polar region and a clockwise vortex sticking out of the south polar region. And they are the things we need to focus on. Similarly, uh, the horizon vorticity is the normal, normal component of the frame drag field. And there are horizon vortexes, regions of large horizon vorticity, a blue horizon vortex out of which the north polar vortex sticks out, and a, a blue uh, clockwise horizon vortex out of which the counterclockwise vortex sticks out. I'm going to show you movies where we watch what goes on with the horizon, and whenever you see that, 
a horizon vortex, you were to think of these vortex, uh, of the three-dimensional vortexes, the vortex lines sticking out of the horizon vortex. So here is an example. We're going to look at two black holes that are spinning in opposite directions. Their spins are perpendicular to the direction uh, in which they are falling together. Uh, and uh, we're going to see what happens as these black holes collide and merge. So I'm going to walk this thing through. So on the left you see then a counterclockwise vortex on the top of the left black hole, a clockwise vortex on the uh, top of the right black hole. Those vortex lines are sticking out of that. Vortexes are sticking out of the three-dimensional vortexes. As the black holes merge, the vortexes retain their individual identities. You now have four vortexes sticking out of a single black hole. Originally, you had two. Uh, the black holes merge, and they begin to vibrate. Now, watch as they vibrate. You have, on the right, a blue vortex. But as the black hole vibrates, you now have a red vortex on the right. We'll let it go. It oscillates back and forth between red and blue, red and blue. The vortexes retain their identities. But what was a clockwise vortex here and a counterclockwise vortex there, they feel each other's presence. And they oscillate back and forth, exchanging vorticity as they feel each other's presence. Really a quite intriguing behavior. And wh whenever this thing turns completely green, there are no more vortex lines sticking through the black hole. What happens is the vortex lines have momentarily popped off of the black hole, reconnected. And we see in the next slide what they have produced. Uh, well, first here, this is just uh, show showing the vortex lines sticking out to remind you that there are vortex lines sticking out of those horizon vortexes. And the vortexes robustly retain their individuality. Here you have a picture during this oscillation. At a, uh, in the upper left, you have a picture uh, of vortex lines on the merged black hole. Uh, red vortex lines coming out of this red horizon vortex, going back down into the other red horizon vortex. Blue ones. And then uh, as the oscillation switches to the opposite vorticity, these vortex lines reconnect, and they form a smoke ring, a beautiful smoke ring. This is from the simulation. This is not, uh, not some analytical calculation. This is directly from the simulation. A smoke ring of vortex lines that expands outward. Uh, and then at the next ha oscillation, a second smoke ring of vortex lines that expands outward, and so forth. So you have this sequence of smoke rings of vortex lines coming off in this geometrodynamical behavior. Uh, during this uh, collision, you also have a, uh, some interesting behavior of tendex lines. This is a picture during the merger, uh, right at the merger, of what's going on with tendex lines. Uh, you have a squeezing tendex lines coming off of the neck during the merger and stretching tendex lines coming off of the end. And it turns out there's some elegant mathematics involved here. The, uh, the vial curvature scalar, psi 2, is ENN plus IBNN. And the so-called complex curvature, which is the scalar curvature of the horizon, plus I times a quantity that is denoted by the aficionados by chi, aside from some small spin coefficients, that's the same as psi 2, which means that ENN, the horizon uh, tendicity is just the scalar curvature of the horizon. That scalar curvature is positive in the ends and negative at the neck, which tells you immediately then that at the neck you're going to have a squeezing tendex line sticking out, at the ends you're going to have stretching tendex lines sticking out. So I'll let you watch then the tendexes on the horizon oscillate on the bottom of this movie as the vortexes on the top also oscillate. Now, it's uh, interesting. Uh, so, so we have seen one example here uh, in which we have uh, the uh, vortexes and the tendexes retain their individual identities, uh, but they oscillate 
back and forth exchanging vorticity. Here is a case of two black holes that are orbiting around each other. They're going to spiral together. Uh, they have spin angular momentum pointing, I mean orbital angular momentum pointing up, but their spin angular momentum are pointing down. And so what happens in this case, in this simulation that also comes from the Caltech Cornell CETA collaboration, is that uh, for the, the black hole horizons raise tides on each other, the tides merge, and the orbital angular momentum creates a blue clockwise vortex on the left, on the top of the black hole. You're looking down on this black hole uh, merger on the left. So you get a blue clockwise vortex on the top, a red one on the bottom. Uh, opposite signs to, what's, uh, to the vortexes that came from the spins. So we now have six vortexes on a single black hole, two in the center that come from the orbital motion, and the uh, four on the ends that come from the uh, original spins of the black holes. And as you follow what happens in this case, because they're side by side and uh, pointed in opposite direction, there is some tendency for these vortexes to diffuse into each other and annihilate. So after a few times around, look on the right-hand side where you see, uh, you still see some evidence of the original spin vortexes uh, in, in a deviation from axis symmetry. But after a few spins of the merged black hole, the uh, original spin vortexes have been absorbed into the uh, have been absorbed into the vortexes that came from the orbital angular momentum. So we've seen now two kinds of dynamics that can occur. There is some diffusion and annihilation. There is some cases of exchanges of vorticity. Uh, in the generic case, and I'm not going to show you a movie of this. We don't have a very good movie yet. In the generic case, what happens uh, if you have sort of arbitrary pointed uh, uh, spins, uh, the four spin vortices uh, wind up sticking out of the merged black hole and forming spiral arms around the merged black hole. These spiral arms going out become gravitational waves. I'm going to say a bit about how that happens in a moment. But first let me go to the pro issue where we have analytic calculations of normal mode pulsations of a non-spinning black hole. This is an old problem. It was studied during the first golden age by Reggie and Wheeler originally, later by Chandrasekhar and Detweiler and others. Uh, and, but we've never really understood what was going on with the space-time curvature in these so-called normal, quasi-normal mode oscillations of a black hole. So what turns out to be going on is this. I'm showing you two sets of vortexes. There are actually four vortexes, but there are two, uh, there are two that I'm showing the vortex lines for here. Uh, the red vortex lines coming out the upper right and the lower left, sweeping back, forming spiral arms. And then coming off of the blue part will be vortexes coming out uh, and uh, giving spiral arms of the opposite vorticity. And so these are just like what happens in a generic collision and merger uh, of spinning black holes. Uh, it's interesting to notice that the speed of light circle, the, point, the, uh, be, the dividing line between near zone and radiation zone, which I'm showing here in yellow, uh, is really quite close to the black hole. And so if you think about what's going on here, you quite soon recognize that the black hole is endowed with four vortexes that stick out of it. And those four vortexes uh, are driving the emission of gravitational waves. As they go around and around, just like me sticking my arms out of my body and turning, they're as real and as physical as my arms, and they are producing gravitational waves in the form of trailing spiral arms as they turn around. So gravitational waves are produced by vortexes that are attached to a black hole. Here is the full, in the, uh, in the equatorial plane, here's the full set of vortex lines. And so you can see there are an interesting structure of the vortex lines. The vortex lines actually can peel off of one vortex, swing across, and join onto another vortex. So it's a rather interesting uh, two-dimensional structure. 
The third dimension is coming out of the equatorial plane. There's also a set of vortex lines that are less important. Um, gravitational wave generation is particularly interesting. If you look at the Bianchi identities in general relativity, uh, two of the Bianchi identities uh, in a local Lorentz frame, just for simplicity, uh, look just like two of the Maxwell equations. And the other Bianchi identities that are not ri written down also do that. The ones I've not written down are divergence of E vanishes and divergence of B vanishes. And this is just the E, D, E is, uh, D, T is the curl of B and then symmetrize in order to uh, keep everything uh, symmetric and trace free. What this means, however, is that if you look at very near the black hole and if this, this is horizon vortex is sticking out, as they turn, they will, through these Bianchi identities, they will generate uh, tendexes. And so the turning vortexes generate tendexes that accompany the vortexes in the spiral arms, uh, and you wind up out in the wave zone with a vortex tendex structure for the gravitational waves that looks like this. Uh, the tendex lines have just the form that you would expect for stretching along one axis and squeezing along the other. And the vortex lines are at a 45 degree, degree angle to the tendex line. So that's the character of, of a, a gravitational wave far from uh, the source. And if I put a vector field E along a red vortex line and a vector field B along a red tendex line, E cross B is the direction of propagation of the gravitational waves. Uh, a few words about vortex tendex research. This is a very new subject. The first paper on this we published uh, last February, I think it was. Thus far, it's primarily a phenomenological subject. We've seen things in our simulations. We have physical pictures of what's going on. We've done very little theoretical work, analytical work, to figure out what's going on analytically. So there are a lot of theory issues to be explored, and uh, we would welcome others in exploring them. The issue, there is an issue of duality between tendexes and vortexes, that uh, there is a mathematical duality uh, that is well known between E and V, the tidal field and the frame drag field. But how does that really manifest itself in the tendex and vortex structure? Why do vortexes and tendexes usually retain their individual identities instead of diffusing and annihilating? You have to, it appears that you have to have something like nearly anti-parallel uh, structures in order to diffuse and annihilate. Uh, what is the physics that's going on here? What's the mechanism for the exchange of vorticity in this case of a head-on transverse spin collision where they slosh back and forth? We don't understand this analytically and there's a lot of uh, opportunity for exploration. How much time do I have? 20 minutes, okay, good. Um, let me now turn to a very interesting simulation that was first done by uh, the research group led by Manuela Campanelli at Rochester, which is now at Rochester Institute of Technology. This is what has been called the extreme kick simulation. We have two black holes that are orbiting around each other, uh, and they have spins, uh, and th these are the spin vectors that I'm showing you in red, that uh, lie in the orbital plane or in, are directed anti-parallel to each other. And as these uh, black holes orbit around each other emitting gravitational waves, they spin, they uh, gradually merge. We're going to watch from a simulation that Manuela's group uh, produced watch the orbital motion. Uh, and you notice that the two black holes go down together, then up together, then down together, up together. Then they merge and they're given a big kick. And you can see the jet contrail uh, sticking behind that's giving them the kick. Uh, that's that's re really just an artifact of the visualization that should not have been there. Uh, and so this motion up together and down together is in apparent violation of momentum conservation until you realize there is a lot of momentum in the spa curved space time outside the black holes. And so when they are going up, uh, there must be down momentum in the curved space time around the black holes. When they're going down, there must be up momentum. And we do understand this in the post-Newtonian approximation. 
Uh, the uh, bobbing was first explained, a uh, lovely explanation by Franz Pretorius. If you uh, look at the two black holes in this orientation, each black hole is dragging the other black hole downward uh, by the frame dragging, the blue arrows are the frame dragging. The next half orbit, they've uh, circled around and now they're dragging each other upward. Next half orbit, they're dragging each other downward and then upward. There, that's only half of the story. There is also a force that comes from coupling of the spins of the black holes to the space-time curvature that they generate. And it's the two of those together that give rise to the bobbing. And I am going to explain the kick in a moment. But I just want to remind you that what you see here, the black holes dragging each other down and up, is something you also see uh, commonly uh, with vortices and fluids. So here are two vortices created by a so-called aerofoil in a fluid. What's going on is you have a, a tank of water, white powder has been sprinkled on the surface of the water, the toy airplane wing has been put in perpendicularly, it's been moved and then stopped, and it has shed two vortexes. And these two vortexes have then, um, let me go back, sorry. These two vortexes then drag each other down through the same process as I described before. So you see in fluids the same process as occurs in space-time dynamics. What causes the big kick? Uh, here are from a simulation that uh, was uh, done uh, largely by, uh, by Rob Bowen at Cornell. Uh, here are snapshots of the horizon uh, candicity on the left and horizon vorticity on the right shortly after the merger. You notice that there is a strong, a big tendex sticking out here along the direction of this E. There's a vortex, it turns out, sticking out along the direction of the B, a blue vortex, though you can't see it because it's hidden down just below the front side of this, uh, this picture. And the angle between the tendex and the vortex is 45 degrees. And that's the same angle as you have in a plane gravitational wave that's going to be emitted. And if you lose the, use the right-hand rule, E cross B here in the near zone, for these vortexes and tendexes that as they turn around, they're going to emit gravitational waves. In the near zone, uh, this uh, E cross B is into the screen. And so if you think that through for a few minutes, you recognize and you use this duality that I said we need to understand more deeply, that the wave generation process by which a tendex sticking out of the black hole emits waves as it turns is the same as the wave generation by a vortex, by a duality relation. Then you conclude, well, because of this 45 degree angle, these are going to generate uh, gravitational waves that superpose coherently into the screen and that uh, superpose destructively out of the screen. And you will have maximum anisotropy of the wave emission in this case. And this is the case that gives the largest kick. And so you're getting a large kick due to the uh, interference or superposition of waves emitted by tendexes that stick out of the black hole, superposing them on and interfering with waves emitted by the vortexes that stick out of the black hole. So this illustrates the kind of understanding we're just beginning to get uh, about uh, what's going on in geometric dynamics. The force of the frame dragging, dragging inertial frames, is really a very, very strong physical force. And I like to use this simulation of a neutron star being torn apart by a black hole to illustrate that. On the right, there is a spinning black hole. Its spin axis is the red arrow. Uh, on the left, there's a neutron star. The black hole is three times heavier than the neutron star. And uh, the black hole is spinning at 0.5 of the maximum rate. See, simulations are done now with spins up to 0.98 of the maximum possible rate. So th these guys are really good in their simulations. The neutron star is orbiting in the horizontal plane. Uh, but the frame dragging, the vortexes associated with the frame dragging, they want to drag it into the plane that's perpendicular to the red arrow. So they're going to take 1.4 solar masses of nuclear matter and throw it up into that perpendicular plane, perpendicular to the uh, red arrow, in the process of tearing the star apart. So you watch in the simulation how this goes. So 
so they're be it's beginning to get thrown up by the, t uh, by the twisting t uh, vortexes. Now been thrown up into that plane. Uh, the star is largely torn apart. Some, something like 90% of the mass has gone into the black hole. Something like 10% has been left behind in an accretion disk that uh, has been thrown by the action of those vortexes uh, up into that perpendicular plane. And in the process, we've had gravitational waves emitted. Uh, you've opened up the inside of a neutron star extremely hot, and you're going to get gamma ray by Ashtakar and Badra uh, Krishnan and their colleagues, and uh, more recently simulations in which these ideas uh, are developed. Uh, and that's another direction. The quantum directions that I mentioned is another direction. I'm going to show you one more direction here in this fascinating simulation by Louis Lehner and Franz Pretorius also an advertisement for, Le uh, for Lehner's lecture on Saturday, where I presume he'll talk about this, but he has a much wider and richer range of things, uh, many of which I think will touch on uh, the new golden age of black hole research. Here, what you're seeing is a black string in four plus one dimensions. You imagine our universe has one more dimension than the three spatial dimensions. Then you can have objects called black strings whose horizons have cross sections that are spherical, but they have translation invariants uh, uh, along the horizon as well. And what we're going to see is a self-similar cascade in which uh, the, uh, this uh, black string is unstable against being converted into a bunch of black holes connected by black strings. And just watch, it's just fabulous uh, to see what happens. Now I'll let him, I presume, I hope he will say something about this, because this is really, I think to me, this is the most fascinating simulation that anybody's done in numerical relativity thus far. Just a sequence on smaller and smaller scales, a sequence of uh, smaller and smaller black holes with thinner and thinner strings between them. And it all goes uh, in a cascade in finite proper time to a naked singularity. Let me conclude the last few minutes uh, with some uh, just a little bit about gravitational wave observations. I want to save some time for a few questions. Uh, gravitational black holes are being studied through gravitational wave observations uh, from with ground-based interferometers, two black holes of two to a thousand solar masses, space-based interferometers, black holes of ten thousand to ten million solar masses, pulsar timing arrays, black holes of a hundred million to ten billion solar masses, uh, and I'll just focus on the ground-based observations. Just a few words of preview of, uh, of further lectures uh, here uh, at this conference. Stan Whitcomb uh, on Sunday will tell you about Earth-based gravitational wave interferometers, a network that consists of uh, LIGO interferometers in the United States, uh, a GEO, which is part of LIGO interferometer in Hanover, Germany, the Virgo interferometer in Pisa, Italy, and two new interferometers that we hope will come online uh, toward the end of this decade. One of the three LIGO interferometers we want to move to India in order to get better angular resolution in support of uh, multi-messenger astronomy. And then we are hoping that the Japanese will build a LCGT interferometer in Japan in order to have a full network that can get the required angular resolution. We need the full network in order to be able to see uh, get the resolution to be able to, on the sky, to be able to tell the uh, optical astronomers, the radio astronomers, where they should point their telescopes to see the corresponding electromagnetic emissions. Uh, there's been a sequence of interferometers in LIGO. We proposed in 1989 we would do a two-step strategy, initial interferometers in 2005 to 2010, which have not seen anything as we expected we probably wouldn't, and advanced interferometers that are now being installed, and, search, and we expect to have searches near design sensitivity in 2017, with LIGO India coming online near design sensitivity around 2020. Bernard Schutz will talk about the astronomy that will be done by these uh, interferometers, including black hole merger astronomy. In support of this, uh, we are building gravitational waveforms by a combination of analytical and numerical techniques. Uh, the technology involved is pushing into the domain of uh, quantum information science, is something else that I hope Stan will say a little bit about. And preparations are underway for multi-messenger astronomy, 
uh, in, at Palomar Mountain and elsewhere. And in the future, the GMRT here uh, near Pune is going to be a major player in multi messenger astronomy for this field. Uh, the problem is getting good enough gravitational wave angular resolution for multi messenger astronomy. And as Stan Whitcomb will describe on Sunday, the solution is LIGO India. And so it's tremendously important to us to have uh, move one of our interferometers to India. And it's a great opportunity for India to move into an area that involves some of the highest and most exciting technology of advanced, uh, uh, of, of high precision measurement that is going on by human beings anywhere in the world today. And with that, let me end. Thank you. Fascinating lecture. To me, it seemed like Suppose Einstein had taught general relativity to Maxwell and asked him to solve the black hole collision problem. Maxwell would come back and say, Professor Einstein, this is the way to do it. So I'm tempted to call this Maxwellian general relativity. It is remarkable, the yes. mathematical analog. Right. So uh, this has been a beautiful lecture. So we can cut a bit into tea, and we'll have 10 minutes for questions and discussion. Start with Abhay. Please wait for the microphone, because the, the importance of having an analytical understanding of these uh, numerical simulations. So in fact, the, the tendexes and vortexes, <coughs> in the actual dynamical situations, really don't refer to the event horizon at all, except maybe in the very, very distant future. They really refer to the dynamical horizon. Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, okay, yes, go ahead, go ahead, yes. And so, and for the dynamical horizons, I mean, for quite some time, we, I mean, in the literature, and also this was done numerically, uh, that there is a notion of just exactly from the electric and magnetic part of the wild tensors, one can construct precisely these multiple moments. And it, I agree that looking at the lines and so on gives a very nice pictorial representation, but it, it would seem to me that a much deeper understanding would come if one just looked at how these multiples settle down to curve. I mean, they'd settle down in a certain way, not, not a random way. And in particular, you know, this issue of the free data uh, that happened. So has this been calculated in the numerical simulations? So the way in which we discovered this behavior numerically uh, was that Rob Owen at, at Cornell had learned about uh, these, uh, the, the issue of horizon multiple moments. He had incorporated that into our code uh, the initial step in order to be able to uh, uh, visualize on the horizon the, the spin and compute the spin of the black hole. Uh, and uh, he uh, then out of the dynamical horizon work. In that so my question is really yeah. what happens to the, uh, just one second, yeah. what happens to the multiple moments? Are the multiple moments kept separately or of, the, of each black so, hole? So Rob has been looking at these issues, and, uh, but uh, we really have not looked at them in great depth as yet. And so that this is obviously a, a, a very good direction in which things should be pushed. Next question. Vertex tendex language is, is, is fascinating. It's really beautiful. It's, it's, it's marvel. One, one feels, so yes, that's the way of thinking of a uh, gravitational field. Uh, TP said it's back to Maxwell. I would say it's, it's even more. Yes, it's back to Maxwell, but it's, it's back to Faraday, right? It's Faraday's <laughs> original intuition of electromagnetic field uh, in some sense with due, with the due differences, of course. Um, now, if you uh, do a formal quantization of the electromagnetic field in, 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 in loop language, the Faraday lines, um, uh, the, the, the loop uh, states are one quantum excitation of Faraday lines with some caveats and some linear combination of I mean, some, some, some forgetting some details. Now, one is tempted then to try to connect uh, this uh, vertex tendex description of the gravitational field to the loop states one has in, 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 in loop quantum gravity. Did you ever? Have you any talked about that? Is there any? Uh, I know nothing about that. And uh, we only had these ideas for a matter of months. And, and oh, this is so recent. So, and and uh, okay. so, yes, I have nothing to say about that except to say, yes, these things should be pursued. OK, uh, thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, let, let me expand slightly by saying these, uh, all, all this is is a tool for visualizing the vial tensor. But that's a tool that I think may have some considerable power in this area, say, an area that I've thought about uh, trying to apply it is 
uh, to understand the dynamics of the gen generic BKL singularities, in particular the spikes that are uh, seen in numerical simulations recently. How does that come ar arise? Perhaps we can get some, uh, some insight through, through visualization techniques there. Uh, but no, there's been, we, we, I've described just about everything that we have done. It's just barely scratching the surface. And we have not done a proper tying this back to other work that other people have been doing. It, uh, we've, we, it, this grew out of, uh, 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 out of the dynamic horizon stuff, but we've not brought it back and come in full circle yet, though we're starting to. And we've not moved at all in, in these directions. John? Phenomenology, and I was wondering... Where, where are you, John? Okay, thank you. So you described some very beautiful theory and phenomenology, and I was trying to think about the possible experimental or observational possibilities. So uh, just recently coming to the news, uh, a cloud of gas is going towards the uh, black hole in the center of our galaxy and is you know, expected to hit in 2013. So can you suggest a sort of observational program to, <laughs> which would uh, relate to your theory? I mean, I can imagine this gas cloud would get sort of twisted and uh, bent out of shape according to uh, what you're showing. So, so what presumably is a Kerr black hole. And uh, that could be analyzed using all the standard techniques uh, of Kerr black holes. What this gives you is a way to visualize what goes on. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't think it gives you, uh, at least as yet, much in the way of additional mathematical tools, aside from the numerical relativity. I've not thought about this at all, uh, but it's an intriguing question of what the frame dragging uh, will do uh, to this gas cloud, but I've, I've not thought about it at all. I, I was only became aware of, of this Im impending gas cloud uh, uh, hitting the black hole a day or two ago. But it does seem like a fantastic opportunity, so yeah. maybe uh, we theorists should uh, think what the yeah. observers should be doing in 2013. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Pankaj. Uh, you uh, mentioned this uh, simulation of, uh, you know, the singularities and the spikes and so on. Uh, this is the issue of, uh, you know, slicing as you all a numerical uh, simulation uh, that you mentioned. Is the slicing uh, validity also checked uh, in the simulations yeah. that you So, uh, we, of course, we do understand the dependence of uh, the tidal field and the frame drag field on slicing. It's a very, very similar uh, to uh, the dependence of the electric field and the magnetic field in Maxwellian electrodynamics on slicing. Um, in practice, uh, in this work, all that we have done is seen that it appears that the qualitative behavior uh, is independent of slicing. We do simulations with uh, different slicings. We've done, not, not done very much of that. But I think the reason for that is that everybody builds their codes in such a way as to make them behave robustly. And that entails basically putting on a, a, a slicing that is asymptotically inertial, or in some, certain cases, asymptotically characteristic. But asymptotically inertial and, and a, uh, uh, in, in as smooth a way as possible. Because if you don't do that, then you get in trouble with your simulations. Uh, but. Uh, but about all I can say is, at this point, aside from saying, yes, well, people have known for decades uh, the slicing dependence of EIJ and VIJ, is that it appears that the qualitative behaviors here don't depend on slicing when you go from one numerical simulation to another. But there's been only a little bit of study of this, just the beginning. Uh, the cosmic <laughs> string is here to understand how a kink on a cosmic string radiates using your formalism? I don't know. We haven't looked at that at all. That, that, that's a, a research problem for your students. OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Spenta? Uh, in this uh, simulations of the mergers of black holes, is it possible for you to track the way the horizon area actually, uh, as a function of time, whether it is monotonic or whether there are some wiggles, et cetera? Is it possible? Uh, yes, it is possible. I mean, these simulations are now highly accurate. Uh, the answer. And uh, I don't know that anybody has done that, actually. But, but, it's, but it's monotonic. I mean, there's just the analytical laws that, yeah. uh, that say that it's monotonic, and yeah, the numerical right. simulations that's have right. actually verified these analytical yeah. laws that's actually right. hold. So they, uh, 
the, law, the laws say it's monotonic, and that's not been checked, but we certainly oh. expect it would have to come out that way. Yeah. Uh, okay. There's a question in the back. Uh, yeah. Let me just say, with regard to horizon area, there are simulations now that, that, that I've been very pleased to see uh, where, during an in-spiral, uh, as the black holes interact tidally. Uh, you can watch, even when they're quite far from merger, you can watch the horizon area gradually increase. And you can uh, watch the evolution of the spin due to tidal coupling. And the degrees spot on with uh, post-Newtonian approximation calculations early on. And it's re it shows, and here you're dealing with things at that point that are part in 10 to the 4. And it shows what really good accuracy these, these uh, young numerical, numerical relativists are achieving. Patrick, uh, you showed uh, the line with the orbital uh, plane. Uh, has the simulation been carried out also for a compact white dwarf uh, to check whether there is some kind of a thermonuclear detonation triggered by the uh, tidal and uh, frame dragging fields of the black hole? Uh, so uh, I know the numerical relativists have not been doing those kinds of calculations to my knowledge, but there have been a lot of calculations of, uh, of the tidal uh, distortion, heating, uh, uh, and disruption of, of white dwarfs by massive black holes. Uh, but I have not followed the detail of that, details of that research. That's generally done uh, uh, not using full-blown numerical relativity, but using approximation techniques. Okay, please. Kip, I like, I like this result that the um, gravitational wave luminosity in a black hole coalescence is actually independent of the mass. Well, you know and, that. And I know, well, I know of a similar result with cosmic strings, that the gravitational wave luminosity of a cosmic string loop is independent of its size. I'm just wondering, is there a more general result behind both of these? Those are both just special cases of? I don't know. Okay, Suresh? Since the resultant black hole has a kick in one direction, does it imply that most of the gravitational wave momentum is carried is carrying the, re, the remnant uh, momentum in the opposite direction? Does it mean that the gravitational waves are beamed in a particular direction? So the gravitational waves are somewhat beamed. Now these kicks, the maximum uh, kick velocities are about uh, roughly uh, 3,000 kilometers per second. And so that's 1% uh, of the speed of light. And uh, so that means that there's uh, some anisotropy, but it's not a huge anisotropy. Uh. Uh, okay, possibly only one or two more questions. Apparent success of this numerical relativity program gives uh, reasonably good uh, indirect evidence for the cosmic censorship conjecture in four dimensions. I mean, do, do your simulations, do you, do you see simulations that ever hit naked singularities? With I, there have been no simulations to give naked singularities. There have been some attempts to uh, search for naked singularities, do simulations that point in that direction. Uh, some controversial hints that there might be naked singularities forming, but uh, no uh, compelling evidence whatsoever. I, I think, by and large, uh, the simulations pretty strongly support cosmic censorship.